Dust Jackets, Conversations with Authors. Today I have a very special guest that's not only an author, but also a computer geek like me. He's always looking to the future of book distribution. But first, let me read his formal bio for you. Lawrence O'Brien was born in Dublin. He studied business, then IT at Oxford University. After going to England, he paid for his own courses and began rising at 4 a.m. so he could study and work at the same time. One early job was as a kitchen porter near the Bank of England, cleaning the plates of the well-connected. He stayed in squats in London and struggled for years. Lawrence was first published by a school newspaper when he was 10 for a short story about aliens getting lost. 35 years later, he attended autonomy workshop and not long after was offered a publishing contract for three books. The first of which the Istanbul Prize won the Outstanding Novel Award at the Southern California Writers' Conference in 2007. I first met Lawrence seeking help for my Twitter account. He helped me to get started in how to build a following. And I have to say, I truly owe at least half my followers to his assistance. So welcome to Dust Jackets, Lawrence. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to meet everybody and great pleasure to be here. Hello. And um, for those of you that are detecting an accent, I forgot to tell you that Lawrence is from Ireland. So uh, Lawrence, I wanted to start off today talking about a project that we're both involved in, but you really are the leader and mover and shaker on this. And that is book NFTs. For those of you who don't know, NFTs stand for non-fungible token. And what that really means is kind of a way to prove authenticity of something that you're buying in the digital sphere. And if you've seen um, any of the NFTs that artists have put out, you know, we've seen some really amazing um, sales, for example, Beeble's, you know, multi-million dollar sale, or um, recently, I think um, Tim Berners-Lee um, actually put an NFT out of his initial code for the internet, and I think that was a $5 million sale. But books are on a, a different level, we think. I don't know um, anyone, maybe J.K. Rowling might be able to garner uh, millions of dollars for something that she would put up as an NFT, but um, so um, we're taking a different approach with that. And can you talk a little bit about that? What made you decide uh, that this was the way to go and, and how are you approaching it that other people haven't been able to solve the problem with books in that sphere? Well, I was particularly taken with NFTs in terms of the new technology opportunities that it provides. So we're not looking to be a get rich quick sell for millions NFT. What we're doing at Books Go Social with our NFTs is providing low cost, reasonably priced ebook special editions between $20 and $200 with the majority of 20, 25, $30. And that is a reasonable price when you consider that you have a selection of books, uh, items usually inside it. The, the, in some cases, it's a box set. In other cases, it includes an audio book as well. In other cases, it includes extra stories and audio. In one case, there's a song. And in some cases, there are also uh, video files as well included. So all of those items are put together into what we call a special edition. So $20, $30, $40 is the majority, the majority of our ebook NFTs are at that price. So we're not looking to try and sell something for a million dollars or anything like that. But what, I, what struck me about NFTs, the opportunity with NFTs is the fact that they are moving into many areas because they are recorded on the blockchain. And you've probably heard about cryptocurrencies and how they're becoming interesting and um, value the value of cryptocurrency fluctuating rapidly. So this is based on a cryptocurrency, on the WAX cryptocurrency, which is a green, an entirely green cryptocurrency. That means it's carbon neutral. So we were taken by that particular 
um, uh, style of cryptocurrency because of the fact that it's carbon neutral. So that is, uh, let's put that issue aside and you can look that up. It's also been used by William Shatner. And for me, if uh, William Shatner uh, minted his NFTs on wax, uh, it's good enough for me. But uh, we also see people like Atari and Marvel and lots of others minting their NFTs. So it's not just that, uh, the fact that we're doing it at a reasonable price, uh, but it's the inherent qualities of the NFT and this as a change in the internet in what has been happening on the internet, which really struck me as something different. And I was taken with it the way uh, when I heard about the internet 30 or so years ago and how interesting it was, the, this change in what NFTs and the blockchain provides for people. So to give you an idea what that is, it's you get the NFT is a uh, contract, it's a token, which is a contract, which says that you own something. So what do you own? When you buy an ebook NFT, imagine the idea of buying an ebook at 20, 30, $40 with the extra content, enjoying it, but then being able to resell it. And that struck me as hugely important because it means that we have a secondary market for the reader. After they've enjoyed reading the book, there's a secondary market. And because all of the transactions are recorded, the author can also get a share of the secondary rights. And in our case, we've set that at 10%. So this is a fundamental change for authors. For the whole history of writing, authors have written books and then if someone decides to resell them, the book that you've written, we don't get anything. So these factors, the benefit for the reader, that you as a reader, and I'm also a reader, that I could buy something for $25 and then in a few weeks time, I can sell it again. And one of the reasons that is you're able to do that is because these are limited editions. So in our case, we're basing these on one of a hundred limited editions. They could be one of a thousand or one of 10. It's up to the author in our, in our case to decide uh, what is the limit on the number of editions. So in this particular special edition that you would buy, say for $25, this would be one of a hundred. And that means it retains some value and it can be sold later. So there are arguments to say that ebook NFTs might go up in price over the next year or two. There's other arguments to say they might go down in price like, like anything, like after you buy something. But the concept of being able to resell something for me was striking. The idea that you could hold on to it and at some point you could try and resell it. And on the WAX uh, currency system, there is a marketplace where you can put things up for resale and it could also be res resold uh, privately as well it's up to you uh, we ask you to we ask readers to uh, inform us and if it's done on the blockchain uh, then it is inform us and we can get 10 percent the 10 percent will come back to us automatically and we are encouraging people to put it through or inform us of any other sales that take place put it through the wax blockchain so those two key things that you're able to um, uh, resell uh, a digital content that you buy and that the author gets a percentage of the resale value are significant. And I mean for me that the idea of NFTs are going to continue, that it's not going to die because of a boom and bust in the price of art on NFTs. Those particular concepts mean for me that this is going to last a long time. And from what we've seen of the interest so far from authors and from readers, this is likely to continue for a long time. So we've started with our first test with 14 books released near the end of June, and they're currently selling. And we have one who ha which has sold for $100, which is an ebook with added content, one of our special editions sold for $100, which we believe, and certainly I've never heard of an ebook selling for $100 ever in the English speaking world. And I believe that's a record for the price of an ebook. And that person believes they're a fan of that author, and they believe that they've got good value, that they own this one of 100 special editions. There's some really nice 
material inside that special edition. They believe they've got good value. They can also read the book, enjoy it as well. And then in the future, they can sell it. So that's the basic concept. I don't think we have to worry about how the blockchain is put together, just as we don't have to worry about how our jet engines are put together when we take a flight from A to B. We just need to know that they work. So the blockchain works and there's a lot of stuff being uh, relying on the blockchain now and more and more is going to move in this direction because it's a permanent record and they expect a lot of contracts are going to move in the direction of the blockchain. We already have the NFTs and there are various other uh, things moving towards being recorded on the blockchain. We don't have to know exactly how it works as long as it works correctly and a lot of people are using it. We can go from A to B, we can buy an NFT ebook, store it in our uh, wallet, which we get access to, easy access to online, and then sell it, enjoy it, read the book, watch the video files, listen to the music if there's music contained with it, and then resell it when we decide we want to do that. So that just struck me as so new and so different. Because as you know, you can't resell. You could buy as many eBooks as you like from any of the big online stores, but you are certainly not allowed to resell them uh, at uh, any price. So that just struck me as so new, so different that we really had to get involved. Well, thank you for that really great introduction, Lawrence. And, um, and I have to agree, you know, the only way I've ever been able to resell a book is a paper book to a used bookstore. And usually it's pennies on the dollar that I paid for it initially. So, um, and I think so many people are doing eBooks now. I rarely buy um, a print book myself just because I can keep a thousand eBooks in my, in my little tablet. So, you know, when I travel, I, I don't have to have a big heavy suitcase. Um, one of the things I would love for you to talk about and that drew me to your particular project is that when people purchase their NFTs, they don't have to be worrying about the cryptocurrency because that can be quite confusing. You know, was $1 is 0 0.015 of Ethereum or whatever it is today. And so how have you solved that problem um, for people who just, you know, they don't want to do the whole cryptocurrency thing. They just want to give you their, their money in dollars or pounds or euros. Sure, and that's a really important thing. Um, a lot of uh, younger people, uh, well, younger than me, like the whole uh, NFT thing because it's all about cryptocurrencies and wallets and things which the older generation don't know anything about. It's all their secret stuff, which they can keep from us, which I'm sure we were like uh, 30 years ago. You know, we wanted stuff for our generation. But what we're doing at Books Go Social, so this is booksgosocial.com, you'll see our NFTs for sale there, we have 14 NFT eBooks. What we're doing is allowing people to buy in dollars with PayPal or Stripe, things that they know about, and also allowing people to get a refund within seven days if they don't like it. And it's reasonable if you buy something for 20 or 30 or 40 or even $100 that you should be allowed. If you open it up, you see it's not what you expected. This was one of the principles of the internet at the beginning was always the idea that you get a refund if you didn't like what you had bought. So we're keeping to that and we're doing those two important things, allowing you to pay with PayPal or your credit card, both of which offer a refund service. So even if you think, oh, are they gonna actually refund me? You can go to Stripe and you can ask for, or your PayPal account and you can ask for your refund and you will get it. Uh, so um, that's really important, I think, to allow people to purchase this uh, ebook NFT, which they can resell later and do it just with PayPal and in dollars. So there's no confusion about pricing and what do I have to, am I getting involved with cryptocurrency? There's no confusion with any of that. We have, after purchase, we have a one-click wallet where you can uh, um, uh, accept your NFT contract so that you can repurchase, so that you can resell that book. So that's on the WAX blockchain. And again, it's used by William Shatner. He sold a lot of NFTs on this uh, system. And it really is, it's the easiest wallet I've seen, but that is 
afterwards when you want to take your contract which shows ownership of the nft to buy the nft is in paypal there is no extra there are no extra fees involved at the later stage it's simple if it's 25 dollars, that's it that's what you paid and we guarantee that you can get a refund on that money within seven days if you change your mind so that solves that problem of do you have to get involved in cryptocurrencies that's really great um so i think what i'd like to do is to um move over to you as an author lawrence because that is a big part of of the interviews that we do here and um, a great segue for that is to ask well um, i saw that you've written it looks like 14 15 books at this point um, so which one did you choose to put on as an NFT and why did you choose that and, and what other content did you include? Thank you. That's uh, really good. So I have, I think it's about 12 now. Uh, one just came out, uh, did have a nonfiction as well, but a novels uh, 12. And what I put up is the uh, box set of A Dangerous Emperor, which is about the life of Constantine the Great. And it's a fictionalized account. And the reason I put it up is because it's received the most reviews, five-star reviews um, in a, as a series of my own self-published. So I did, HarperCollins did publish three books for me at the beginning. Uh, but these are self-published, which also means I have the right to do it. I have the, because I own the copyright, I have the right to do it. And uh, so I put the three book box set plus a extra story, a short story at the end, which is about Constantine's death, which isn't included on the books you can buy on Amazon. So it's got an extra short story plus a video. It's only a two or three minute video uh, explaining my research sources for A Dangerous Emperor and why I decided to write um, that book. Uh, it started about 20 years ago and I'm particularly interested in that because I was told by a couple of people that it would never do well, that it was impossible uh, to sell that and I didn't manage to sell it to a publisher, but it has gone on to get hundreds of and um, uh, shockingly good reviews. If I ever feel down, I can go to Amazon and look up some of those good <laughs> reviews, which tell me how wonderful and, and how much people enjoyed the book. So it's uh, got lots of reviews and you get this extra content, a video, an extra story, you get the whole a box set, which you'd have to buy separately on Amazon. In any case, there isn't a box set on Amazon. So you get this unique collection. And I really enjoyed um, writing that series uh, about Constantine. I found his life fascinating. Uh, he was the first Christian Roman emperor. He introduced Christianity. Well, not introduced it. He made it the official uh, religion of the empire. Up until that uh, point you probably know that there were persecutions of uh, Christians were being persecuted thrown to the lions and there was a persecution just before he uh, he uh, decided to make it the official religion and there's a very famous battle and so that's depicted the battle of the Milvian bridge that's depicted in some uh, amazing uh, paintings in in Italy and uh, in the Renaissance about his his battle and the, so there's a lot of stories about how Constantine came to came to become Christian, and, and uh, what I decided to do was to turn those stories into fiction. How he went from being uh, a captive uh, with another emperor on the far side of the empire, with his father almost disdaining him and not wanting any contact with him. And then his father mysteriously dying in York in Northern England while he was there and him being elevated by the troops, by the legions being elevated in York to become emperor of the West. And then him having to fight his way across the empire and defeat his 
the other uh, emperors who were against him uh, and defeat them outside of Rome at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And so many other stories about his life just fascinated me. So I used artistic license to fill in the gaps. I did a lot of research over many years, attended lectures and uh, classics and various other things and bought all the books about his life and just really enjoyed the adventure. I've always liked adventure books, really enjoyed that adventure. And it was a completely different time. And if you weren't careful, you had a sword put through you in those days. Uh, mm -hmm. She said the wrong thing. So very different time to the very civilized, generally civilized society we have. Um, uh, let's not talk about that. Uh, but <laughs> it's a big escape thing as well. It's a great adventure. So I hope people like it. It's a dangerous emperor and that's on the site. Thank you so much. And, um, and I will, as usual, be um, sh sharing shots of Lawrence books as well as, as all of the site information that we've been talking about. Um, so history, a lot of my readers um, love historical novels. And so I'm hoping those of you listening who, who do like those might want to try this out. Um, and I did mention it to my husband, who's a history major, and he said, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I suspect that um, he will be very interested in, in reading that as well. Um, you also have done um, some science fiction, I noticed, when I was looking you up. Um, which makes sense. So many people I know who are part of the IT industry um, like science fiction. You, you mentioned William Shatner of Star Trek already, of course. Um, so I think I saw three science fiction series. Is, is that right? Or Well, there's a new, I have a, the HarperCollins uh, series was the Istanbul puzzle, the Manhattan puzzle, the Jerusalem puzzle and various other puzzles. Uh, but those are near future um, uh, semi-science fiction uh, novels. Most recently, I have a novel which is about the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant in Ireland, uh, which is, I know it's a long shot, okay, <laughs> but, but there is some reason to believe that the prophet Jeremiah came to Ireland um, the uh, current Queen Elizabeth of England claims her bloodline, royal blue bloodline from King David through this connection to the prophet Jeremiah who escaped uh, Jerusalem uh, with two princesses from the uh, uh, Jewish uh, royal family uh, and brought them to Ireland. And so this is a story which has been passed down in Ireland and also featured, uh, and I was in a Discovery Channel uh, Discovery Science uh, channel, you can find it on there, The Secrets of the Lost Ark, uh, which is currently showing, only came out last month, uh, talking about this. Um, but there are various theories. If you liked the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you might believe that it ended up in Ethiopia. There's <laughs> other people who believed it ended up in a cave in Israel somewhere. And then there is this theory that it might have come to Ireland uh, because of the Jewish princesses who came by boat and traveling from the Mediterranean to Ireland is quite common. We have examples of pottery and things from Phoenician pottery in Ireland from that area. So it's quite mm -hmm. common travel by boat. It would have been an arduous journey, you know, taken months, but people did it and they were uh, trading in tin and various other things, uh, gold tin and um, Anyway, so that was turned into a novel, which is also about quantum physics. So I bring in quantum physics and the Ark of the Covenant. So that's, uh, that's uh, available on Amazon uh, uh, at the moment and uh, as well. So that was just an aside. I was like uh, writing that uh, because, of the, because of the pandemic and also because I was invited to participate in this uh, Discovery Channel uh, series to speak about um, Ireland and uh, uh, the possibility that uh, the prophet Jeremiah had come here. Oh, well, that does really sound fascinating. Um, <clears throat> here in the, in the U.S., of course, the Indiana Jones series um, has been very, very popular and is on almost continuously available on some cable channel um, or Netflix or somewhere else. So people can watch it again and again. And this gives them another opportunity to, to see another take on, on some of those things. That's really great. Um, 
So what are you planning to do next in terms of your author life? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I have a, a book I wrote um, about uh, 10 years ago, which I'm going to go back to. Now, I know they say never go back to uh, your first books, but I have to tell you that The Dangerous Emperor was my first book, and I, comp I, I left it aside for 10 years and came back to it and completely tore it apart, rewrote it, got multiple edit drafts on it. So I'm planning to uh, go back to a book I wrote 10 years ago called Sisters, which is about um, some terrible things uh, happening around the world about the use of um, um, fetuses for various experiments. I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but some horrible stuff that's been hidden from us. And it's just about facts, um, those things, you know, I'm not going to be moralistic in any way about anything. I'm just talking about facts and how we might need control, particularly for young women who are in difficulty in this area. So it's called Sisters and it's about someone who finds himself in difficulty uh, in San Francisco. And so it's partly based in San Francisco. Uh, and I spent a little bit of time there visiting various places, locations and things there and also based in London as well. So it's a, it's a near future, uh, what they, the horrible things they get up to if you get caught up. So it's a, it's a psychological thriller. And so that's what I'm working on. And I've got a lot of notes to take that one forward. And I really like uh, uncovering and helping people um, uh, and speak about it and have stories about things that we don't usually talk about and that are difficult things. So I know I'm jumping around a little bit in my books and they advise you not to, but unfortunately that's where I'm being led by whatever it is that's leading me this way. Oh, well, I actually love that about you because I'm the same. I, I write in like four different genres and, and I know that that's not what you're supposed to do, but that's what's so great about being independent, right? Yeah. <laughs> you get to choose what you want to do. Um, and. I think read, there's readers for lots of different things. So it's just a matter of finding them and, and letting them know that you're the kind of writer and you have the kind of voice that they really want. So I, I think it's great. Um, it's not always the best way to make the most money, but we have to do what's in our heart for sure. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with that. And it's great to be uh, independent, to be able to keep that and not to have some corporation telling you you have to uh, do this and that and you don't have the freedom to do what you want so yes it's the indie flag we can wave on that one yes absolutely and that actually kind of brings us full circle around the whole nft movement as well in in that you know authors have control of that and being able to set their prices and being able to um, resell um, books allow their books to be resold and and all of that which i think um, has drawn a lot of independent authors into, into that environment. So um, another thing I would just like to talk about briefly, um, because you did mention your company, Books Go Social, which is spearheading this whole NFT book effort, but your company also does a lot of other things. Um, and I know that I do have many authors that listen to this podcast. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about some of the other things that Books Go Social offer and uh, that authors may be interested in, in knowing about? Well, I spent a long time uh, studying and working in marketing uh, and working in IT and marketing. And after being published, I found I had a lot of followers, HarperCollins, that did some great work um, in various uh, digital initiatives, which ended up with uh, me having a good following on Twitter and Facebook and uh, uh, email following. And I started helping other authors to market their books. And so that was back in 2013. And then in 14, 15, we started doing Amazon ads for people and uh, then doing Facebook ads. So we do Amazon ads, Facebook ads, and we also help people to self-publish. And that is uh, not uh, vanity publishing, but if you decide that you want to 
Um, uh, you want somebody to proofread your book, you're going to put it up on, uh, on Amazon KDP yourself, but you want a proofreader or a cover designer, so you can select a service that you want. You maybe had a proofread, proofread already and you want to, someone to just upload it for you. So we have a selection of services to help people self-publish and really keen on people self-publishing um, because they get paid monthly direct to their bank account. Uh, by Amazon. So it's no, there is no publisher standing between you telling you you have to wait six months. Uh, you just get paid every month. So really encourage people to put their own books up. But often people say, okay, I can do all the proofreading editing, but I need some help with uh, a cover or something else. So we help with that. And then we help with the marketing. That's uh, Amazon ads, uh, Facebook ads, and we have some big email lists as well. We do those as well. And we've combined packages with all of those services in it. And we offer a refund service, cash refund service if people are unhappy. And we generally pay out um, one or two refunds every month. Uh, and it's, we can't, there are some books, um, they uh, slip through and they, uh, we start doing the work on them and then nobody buys them and people want their money back. I think it's really important along the lines of that internet, the promise of the internet which was that if you bought something on the internet that you could have your money back if it didn't work out. Uh, we do take off, if you've, we've paid Amazon ads for you, we do take off those uh, ads fees, but usually they can be stopped pretty quickly if uh, people are unhappy with the service and we spend only $20 or something. And we also wanna protect our good name as well, of course, to make sure that, because we're interested in the long-term being an, uh, an advertising agency for books and the long-term support for authors. It's difficult now, authors have um, almost have to pay to play. They have to do some ads to get seen. You might, have, you might be William Shakespeare or the best writer ever, but if you're, unless you're doing some sort of advertising, you get lost on Amazon. And so that's why we do relatively modest um, couple of hundred dollar programs where you can test, do Amazon ads work, do Facebook ads work. Because the whole principle of marketing is based around the idea of testing things. Um, that's, those are the principles, you know, when you do, when you study marketing, you're supposed to test does, you know, if you do Amazon ads, does it work? Do you need to change your cover? Do you need to change your description? Do you need more reviews? So all those steps. And we do our best to provide a personal service as well, which is um, there's real people uh, available for a phone call, all of that uh, to help people. So that's that's what Books Go Social does. And uh, and I can actually say for myself, I have used the service myself, um, and um, and that's why I I can recommend it wholeheartedly. And I um, also have uh, recommended people and. Um, at least one of them did uh, request a refund and did get it. And so um, I think it's really important um, because people know that I don't ever recommend something that I have not used before myself or um, that I you know, know the people involved. So for those of you listening, if this is something you're interested in, you know, I do definitely recommend um, Lawrence's company. And no, he's not paying me anything. I'm not getting affiliate money or anything else uh, for saying that. It's just because I honestly believe that they do the very best job they can. Thank you. So, absolutely. Um, so Lawrence, I think that we're about to the end of our time here. And, um, but I do wanna just give you an opportunity. Um, we, we know you said booksgosocial.com, which is your company. Uh, do you also have a, a site for just you as, as an author? Yeah, you can see some of the books at lpobryan, L-P-O-B-R-Y-A-N.com. Uh, you can also find me on Amazon at Lawrence O'Brien, that's L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E-O-B-R-Y-A-N. On Amazon, you could see that Roman series if you like a good historical novel. Uh, then yes, hopefully uh, you'll enjoy that um, adventure, historical adventure. And it has uh, very prominent female characters in it as well, who help Constantine to achieve his goal. Um, and they're not mentioned in the history books, of course, uh, very rarely, or just as uh, he, had a, he had a wife. But I can assure you uh, a young and powerful man in his 30s leading the legions would have uh, powerful and important women around him as well. 
it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, most likely true. Um, so hopefully you'll be interested in that, and it's uh, suitable for um, uh, everyone. Um, there is some violence in it, but it's not about battles. It's about the personal relationships and who helped him overcome and who the Christians in his court who helped him as well. So that's it. I hope you like uh, that um, adventure story. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And as usual, I will have all of these URLs in the show notes and it will be in part of the transcripts. So thank you for listening to Dust Jackets, Conversations with Authors. Thank you.